Good morning. I am so glad that you have chosen to be with us this morning. Would you stand and let's worship God together today. Welcome, welcome to Richland Church of the Nazarene here in Richland, Washington. Uh, Dan had told me that that song was going to finish abruptly, so I was, I, was, I was ready. I was ready with a joke, Pastor. I really was. <laughs> ready. Hey, I need to introduce everybody back here. This is Leanne Jackson and her son, Alexander. This is my pastor, partner in crime, Dan Lewis. This is Glenda Cloud on the piano, and we have Charlie Taylor over on vocals here. <laughs> That'll work all right. I can, I can feel it from your living room. Um, 
I, you know, I, I want to open just a very short word of prayer, a couple quick announcements here. Um, I, I recognize this week that I, I've known this all along, but, but it struck me um, the fact that God doesn't live in this place, right? This isn't God's house. I mean, we, we call it that, but he doesn't live here, right? He, he, he dwells within each of us who call him Lord and Savior. Um, and, and I think in this time, we just need to celebrate the fact that God doesn't live just here, right? If we were in ancient Israel, you would have to go to the temple to come face to face with God, and even then you couldn't do it, right? You had to go through that priest, and he was behind the curtain and the whole bit, and and by, by Christ Jesus, we have the gift of the Holy Spirit, and we have God living in us all the time. We don't have to go to him. He's with us. And in this COVID-19, I don't even know if I'm going to call it a season anymore, <laughs> era, um, this is an incredible gift. This is something, this is a silver lining. This is God squeezing good from bad, right? Um, so let's just open up with a word of prayer very quickly. Father God, thank you so much. We want to recognize your presence here because we, the body, who call ourselves by your name, we are gathered in your name. And your word says that you're with us when we do that in a powerful way. Uh, so, Father, we, we thank you for this. We, we acknowledge it. Um, we, we welcome this presence in our lives, in particularly this morning in unity, um, as we, we dig into your word and we find out how to be maybe just a little bit more like your son. Um, a little bit more complete or, or holy, I guess is the biblical word, uh, mature. And so, Father God, uh, thank you for all the team that puts every one of these services together each week. Um, open ears to hear, um, not just to listen, but to hear and to respond well, Father. Uh, thank you for this. In your son's name I pray. Um, amen. I also want to just very, very quick before I go here. <clears throat> uh, if, if you've been a phone caller, I want to thank you. Um, there are a lot of people in our congregation who were already phone callers, right, before we had to start making all these phone calls, and then they were given another list, and, and some of our phone calls, they're just worn out. Others of them, I, it's such a brand new kind of thing that they don't want to give it up. They really enjoy it, which is really, really cool. Um, so I just want to say thank you to the phone callers. Um, thank you for the people who have been phone calling way before any of this, and now you're just tired and, and you're burnt out. I, I mean, this COVID thing is, is forcing us, a lot of us, into really uncomfortable places. And I just want to acknowledge that there are people out there in this body who have been doing so much work quietly behind the scenes, and, and I, I just want to bless them. Um, Father, bless them. Um, if you'd please stand for the reading of his word. Um, but before we do that, just a couple quick announcements. My bad. Um, we will have a church chat August 30th. If you would like to be a part of that, if you would send us your information at info at richlandnaz.org. And we're also, again, this is going to be, <clears throat> hold lightly to this schedule because the governor and things change and then they go back and then they change again. Um, so we are tentatively planning an evening communion service, 7 o'clock, September 6th, the first Sunday um, of the month. Uh, a couple of other things. Charlie's starting another Sunday school class. Um, my advice, please, th this is for everybody. Don't keep waiting for things to get back to normal. I, I think we're recognizing that their normal's gone, right? It's gone. It's in the rear view. So we can't keep thinking to go back. And if you're waiting for church to resume so you can go back to your Sunday school or, or, small, or stop, stop. Lean into whatever is new and going on. Um, we don't know how long this thing is going to last. Don't keep putting off the spiritual things that you need to do, you know you need to do them. Um, so jump in, jump in with this new, t I, I know it's difficult, um, but we might be in this situation for a while. Um, so jump in, God's with you. Please stand for the reading of his word. Thank you. So join me as we read Luke 8, four through eight. While a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told this parable. <clears throat> A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on, and the birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground, and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. These are the days of Elijah. 
declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of your servant Moses, righteousness being restored. And though these are days of great trials, of famine and darkness and sword, still we are the voice in the There's no gun like Jehovah. 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 Beside you, open up my eyes. 
of every song. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever sing. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside. Again, good morning. Um, I recognize a lot of folks, you're, you're watching this and it's evening now, <laughs> right? Like you took a hike this morning, so good evening. Uh, maybe it's Tuesday afternoon, good afternoon. <laughs> uh, technology, it's an amazing thing. Our, our culture doesn't buy into letting you have Sunday morning off anymore. It, it just, so we, we, we find workarounds. God is good. All right, week three of our message series, uh, What If? 
answering several questions. Uh, what if we were given a fresh start, which I think we have? What if we don't want to go back to normal, which I don't think we do? Um, the old normal wasn't everything that God wants for us. And what if he's handing us a great, incredible new opportunity to be more than we, what we were before? Um, and each week, we're kind of looking at pieces of the puzzle, answering different questions, right, related to that so that we can arrive at where God wants us to be and where we, we really want to be too. Um, first, I want, to, I want to spend some time in prayer before we start, um, and then we're going to have a children's ministry moment. We're going to uh, hear from Douglas, and it is Douglas this morning. Um, but, but as I pray, I, a couple things on my mind. Uh, Dan and I were in a, a webinar this morning. <clears throat> Not this morning, it was earlier in this week, Monday, Tuesday morning. And, and in that webinar... Um, it, was, it was addressing pastors who are trying to address the needs of their congregation when they don't see their congregation, okay? And in the midst of this not seeing our congregations, two huge things have happened. One led to us not seeing our congregations, COVID-19, and, th and then the whole uh, Black Lives Matters, the, that, that whole event. Um, and, and what it created, what, what we learned in this webinar is it, it, it created kind of a, a, a split in the church, right, um, in ways that nobody really expected. Um, and on the one hand, they said that we, we have uh, deniers, and on the other hand, we have alarmists. The deniers, oh, there's nothing wrong, there's not a race problem, there's COVID is fake, blah, 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 blah. And then we have the alarmists on the other end of the extreme. You know, everybody's got to line up. This is everybody's problem. We got to address this. We got to drop everything else. So we got these two extremes. And what I want to suggest this morning as we move into a time of prayer is don't let these two extremes trump love. Right? If you're a freedom lover, don't let freedom trump love. Right? And if you're an alarmist, if you're a, you know, orthodoxy, everyone's got to follow the rules, don't let that desire trump love. Right? We, I, I watch on the internet and we, we listen to the news and even it comes out of my mouth, so many extreme statements. And I just think, no, no, that's, that's, that's not the route. That's not, that's not the way of Jesus. So as we enter a time of prayer today, if you find yourself, and, and quite honestly, like as I watch the news, I find myself at one extreme, and then 10 minutes later at the other extreme, right? I, I'm getting jerked back and forth, and maybe you're feeling that same thing, and I just want to challenge you. The Via Media, that was John Wesley, that was the middle way, right? Extremes are where people go to find security, but in the middle, we have the security of Jesus Christ. It, it's not anything that we create it's something that he gave us, this incredible gift. So bow your heads. Let's just move into a time of prayer. Father, wow, again, we, we, we're not seeing each other, and a couple of huge things happen, and, and when we can't eyeball to eyeball, we have so many misunderstandings and so many uh, arguments and differences of opinion. Um, Father, I just pray by the power of your Spirit that your Holy Spirit would take up residence on that continuum and, and draw people toward the middle and not extreme positions that tend to make enemies. I don't think that's the route. Uh, so, Father, help us. Help us find that, that via media, that, that middle way, the, the way of Jesus, um, where we're not depending on what we've constructed that we'll feel secure with, but, but what you've already accomplished Father, thank you. Thank you for this. And also, just in the midst of all of this, Father, when we can't see each other, there have been so many incredibly painful life situations where the body hasn't been able to rally around and, 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 and lift up and to hold each other. Um, many of you are aware Terry Bowers passed and and I would just say lift up Fred and, and, and Mark and, and, and Matt and, and Lori and, and Piper and Adam. Um, and the other, uh, the other one, I can't remember his name, but Father, just lift up that whole family um, feeling a loss now. And also Dean and Carolyn Meyer. Dean, cancer is his spread. Uh, be with Amber, their daughters, their granddaughters as they, as they rally and lift up Dean and, and Carolyn. Carolyn's struggling too. So, Father, lift up this whole family. Uh, you've got to do this a large part without us, Father. We know you call us to work alongside you, but 
our hands are tied just a little bit and we, we need to lean into you extra hard now, Father. So I don't know how you're gonna do it. I just trust that you can, you will, and, and you love to <laughs> relieve the suffering by way of your body, this local body, relieve the suffering of these individuals um, as only we can do in Christ Jesus. Thank you for this day and ever all the hope that it holds for wherever you are this morning, this evening or this afternoon. Thank you, Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen. I think we have a children's ministry moment. Let's hear from Douglas. I love going fishing, but have you ever gone fishing for people? Hey guys, it's me again, Douglas. And uh, so I, I love going fishing with my grandpa. He's got like a little a little lake behind his house and we go out in a little boat and we, we throw our lines in and we, we catch the fish and uh, we just sit there and sometimes we talk and sometimes we just fish and, and we sit quietly and it's really nice. I like it a lot. But um, the other day, my grandpa asked me something that was really confusing. He said to me, he said, Douglas, would you like to be a fisher of men, which was really confusing because when my grandpa and I go fishing, we take this little thing called a lure. It's a, it's a fake little fish looking thing and it's got hooks on it and you, you throw it into the lake and then you pull it in with your fishing rod and you kind of wiggle it around so that the fish think it's alive. And then if a fish thinks that it's alive and they want to eat it, then they take a bite and then they get hooked on the hook and then you pull them up and then you cook them and eat them. And so my grandpa asked me if I wanted to be a fisher of men. If I want to go fishing for people, I was like, uh, no. But then he was like, oh, no, no, let, let me explain what I mean. And so then he started to tell me about how Jesus talked to his disciples, and he told them that they were going to be fishers of men. Because the, the people that followed Jesus, several of them were fishermen. But they didn't fish like my grandpa and I do. My grandpa and I, you know, we just go fishing sometimes, you know, maybe once or twice a month. And we do it with the hooks and the, and the lure and all that. And we get, you know, maybe we might get a couple fish, two or three fish a day. But these guys, Jesus' disciples, they fished for their job. Their whole job was fishing. And so they'd all get on this big boat and they would, they'd take nets with them. They didn't fish with hooks, they fished with nets. And they'd go out into the sea and they'd throw their nets out. And then after a while, they'd pull their nets in and there'd be some fish in the nets. And this was their job. They did it almost every single day. But instead of being fishermen, Jesus wanted them to come be his disciples. He told them they weren't going to be fishermen anymore. They were going to be fishers of men, fishers of people. And this fisherman metaphor might not make a whole lot of sense for me and how I go fishing, but the way they went fishing, it makes a whole lot of sense. Because as Christians, we want to tell as many people as possible about Jesus. We want everyone to know about God's love for them and Jesus' sacrifice for them. So just like Jesus' disciples went out every single day to go, to go try and catch some fish, we should be going out every single day sharing the love of God, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. And the other thing about that that, that made some sense about, about being fishers of men was the disciples, when they were fishermen, they'd, they'd throw their nets out, and sometimes they'd catch some fish and sometimes they wouldn't. And, you know, some of the fish would swim around the net and some of the fish would swim into the net. And that's kind of the way it is with us, too, when we share the good news of Jesus, is not everybody's going to believe it. No. Not everyone's going to become a Christian if we tell them about Jesus. But, but we can still go out there and we can still show God's love to them. We can still share the good news every day. Just like a fisherman going out in his boat and throwing out his nets, we can go out into the world and show people God's love. So my challenge to you guys today is that you would be fishers of people. You would be fishers of men. And that you would go out every single day and tell people about Jesus and show people God's love. Not just by telling them about Jesus, but by, by living your life in such a way that, that they can see God through you. You would shine a light into this dark world. Because the more people that we show God's love to, the more people we tell about the good news of Jesus Christ, the more people will be saved the more people will get to know God personally in the way that God wants them to know him. And that's such an awesome thing. I want to be a fisher of people.
and I hope that you will too. Well, that video strikes me. <laughs> um, my dad was a fisherman, but I get the impression he really didn't teach us to fish, so we would go to Kmart and get Zebco. <laughs> At one point, I think we had two bamboo poles that screwed together, and we had salmon eggs and cheese that as the summers went by, they got funkier and funkier, but we never got new salmon eggs or new cheese. We just kept using it. And lo and behold, we never caught fish. So I'm, I'm amazed at the, the, I'm, I'm loving today's message because I find out that Jesus actually teaches us how to fish, right? How to be fishers of men, right? How to bait the hook, right? The squirmy little, all that stuff. So I'm, I'm just tickled. Um, hey, week three. Uh, several what-if questions. Um, thus far, just kind of a real quick recap here. What if God does want us happy, right? Week one, what if God does want us happy? Go ahead and hit that next slide there. What if happiness, spiritual happiness, if you want to call it that, gladness, rejoicing, blessedness, all these words in Scripture. Um, what if the joy of the Lord was a gift from God, right? The gift from God that not only drew us to him and drew us to obedience to him, but also drew us to love and forgive and give mercy and grace to our neighbors, right? That, that, that's that, that joy that drives us to do these things. So what if nothing's wrong with wanting happiness? And it's just a question of not exalting happiness over God, right? Or grasping for happiness without God, because it always goes sideways when we do those things. So, the, so that it doesn't go sideways and so that we, we don't hurt each other and so that our happiness is complete, God chooses to deliver happiness through holiness and through maturity, right? Um, without holiness, happiness tends to be self-centered, short-term, prone to hurting self and others, and doomed to failure. To make us happy would have been easy for God, right? He wouldn't, have to ask, he wouldn't ask us anything tough and he'd just give us stuff. Um, but to make us holy is a little more time-consuming, a little more sparks involved, right? But even in dark times, the joy of the Lord is our hope, right? It's what keeps us going. Happiness fuels hope. So it's perfectly okay, I believe, acceptable, even encouraged to make the words of the psalmist our prayer. Psalm 68, but may the righteous be glad and rejoice before the Lord. May they be happy and joyful. And then last week, what if there's more than enough? Right? What if money isn't the issue, and what if scarcity is a lie? We looked at several of Paul's letters to better understand the difference between the limited economy of our world and God's unlimited um, economy. Crucial to understanding this, all of this was Paul's joy in the Lord. Um, and he found his joy in his ability to recognize the difference between wants and needs and land very, very happily, joyfully at contentment. Right? Contentment. Again, contentment wasn't the goal. That's the goal of a Buddhist, right? In Christ, we have a goal greater than contentment. We have a goal of joy, right? Amazing. I, I love this. I love this. Um, at chapter 4 of his letter to the church Philippi, Paul had accepted a generous gift from the Philippians, and with gratitude and joy, he had received this gift. Um, because they, had met, because they had met his needs, he was absolutely convinced in Philippians 4, chapter, chapter 4, verse 17, that his God would meet all of their needs because they were meeting his needs, right? As a direct result of their sacrifice and service, Paul was absolutely certain that the Lord would fill them to the brim, like to overflowing with blessings, right, that would take care of all of their needs from his abundance, riches of his mercy and love. But there's a catch, I don't know if you caught this last week. There's a catch to this. God's promise to supply our needs is rooted in sacrificial giving, in generosity. It sounds awfully harsh to say this, but God's really not that free with his gifts to stingy, selfish, irresponsible believers. I, I know it's just so brutal to say that, but Scripture leads us to believe that. Um, if you're selfish and stingy, um, there's not going to be a lot coming from his riches and glory. And, and while material possession for our needs is implied 
In verse 17, according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus, the supply that Paul is actually referring to is what they are going to receive from Christ, not from their bank account, not from President Trump, not from anybody else, but from Christ. And, and more than that is what Christ was doing in them and through them. I remember a guy in a Bible study, a men's Bible study I was a part of about 15, 20 years ago. He just made this brilliant comment. We were discussing what kind of blessings. And he said, just kind of casually said, um, I get the distinct impression that the best blessing are relational blessings, not necessarily material blessings. It just it blew my mind. I, I, I hadn't really thought about that. But, but relationships are where we get the most joy, right? Possessions are momentary joy, and then they're gone because they break, they rust, they get stolen, right? And here's the great part. What they receive from Jesus and what he's accomplishing in and through them, again, it won't decay. It won't rust and it won't get stolen. So Paul warns Timothy to warn the wealthy people in his congregation. 1 Timothy chapter 6 says this in verse 17, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain. Just like Jesus was telling us in Matthew's gospel, right? Right? Verse 17 and 18, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Love that. Command them to be good, to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. And here's the kicker. In this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Again, we, we, last week, Jesus isn't against treasures, just investing them in currency that won't last. His suggested currency is kingdom currency, and in a word, that's generosity. That's kingdom currency, is when we're generous and sacrificially generous. And as his children, as recipients of this incredible gift, we're, we're compelled, right, to be as generous as he is generous, right, to give of ourselves as he emptied himself for us. And again, we desire this not because we want anything in return, not because we need a bigger bank account, not because we needed a new car. That's just silly. It's because we wanted to be able to experience the riches of knowing him and being in his presence. That's the, that's the joy of the Lord. His tried and true method of supplying his people is always through Jesus, the most powerful method that produces the best results at which leads us to today's question. Dealing with the fact that everybody deserves to know him and be in his presence, which means we're going to be talking about sharing your faith. Right? So, for those of you who aren't squirming right now, you're excited, right? This is simply, I'm, I'm going to give you another tool for your favorite tool belt, right? Your sharing Jesus tool belt. Um, but for those of you, and I love this phrase uh, Dan does too, for those of you currently flop sweating, because we're going to be talking about evangelism, like heart palpitations, your, your blood pressure's <laughs> going through the roof right now. Um, what if Jesus told us how to share Jesus, right? Again, I've gone fishing many, many times, and nobody has really told me how to fish, so I don't catch fish. I like eating fish. I don't like fishing because I'm unsuccessful. But if somebody would teach me how, I might enjoy it. I might even do it quite often. So what I want to do this morning, I want to teach you, I, I, want, to, I want to let Jesus teach you his method. Because as we're going to find out in Luke, and you can just open up your Bibles, and I'm going to be bouncing all over between chapters 8, 9, and 10 of Luke. Like, so just like you're going to have to have multiple fingers, but it's going to be in just those three chapters of Luke. And what we find out is Luke chapters 8 through 10 is like Jesus's, like his evangelism 101 course. Right? It's amazing. We, we, we quickly read through this, and we, we don't recognize what is being said here. That, and, and actually what's going on is Jesus is giving an incredibly specific and detailed instructions on exactly how to share him. Right? How to share him. It, it, simply amazing. Um, incredibly clear, because in a lot of places in Scripture, Jesus is kind of cryptic, right? But, it, but in this place, he, he's just so, so, so crystal clear. Um, and then he taught his disciples to go and do the same. So what if he showed us how, and, then, and he succeeded? We're going to see that. And then the disciples followed the exact same pattern, and they were wildly successful, right? Time after time after time after time. Would that lower your blood pressure a little bit? Would that whoo, breathe, whoo, whoo, breathe, all right? We're going to talk about evangelism today, but this is going to be a really, really, really good talk, all right? 
His incredibly specific and detailed instructions were given in chapter 9, right at the beginning of chapter 9, and then he's going to repeat them in chapter 10, and that's where I'm going to start, but I'm going to be going backwards. I'm, I'm just going to be flopping, right? You've gotten used to me preaching. So Luke chapter 10, verse 1, after this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. Now, very, very quickly, a couple things, that 70, 72, some of your versions, King James Version, uh, American Standard Version, a lot of them have 70 uh, the NIV and a few others have 72. Um, there's debate as to which one is accurate. There's, there's actually extant uh, ancient manuscripts that have both numbers. Uh, 70, it works for a lot of different reasons. There were 70 members of Sanhedrin. There were 70 elders that helped Moses. According to that time in the world, there were supposedly 70 nations in the world Right? So 70 kind of means something, but 72 kind of has some power behind it too. The idea was, and this is a book in the Apocrypha. It was a letter from Artatius. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, but, but in about 250 BC when the, Pers the Greeks were bearing down on the Jewish people, they selected six scholars from each of the 12 tribes, six times 12, 72, and they sent these people to Egypt and they, they translated the Hebrew into the Greek, what's called the Septuagint. And the Septuagint, that, that means that the actual title of the, the document was uh, the, the translation of the 70 interpreters, even though there were 72. I, it, okay, so we'll, you, that's your homework. You can dig into that, which, which, is, which is which. But the other thing is after this, after this, um, Chapter 9, again, starts out with the 12. He sends the 12, and he sends them two by two, and that's so crucial. And he gives them the exact same instructions that I'm about to relay to you from chapter 10 that he gives to 70 or 72 people that in chapter 9, at the very beginning of chapter 9, he gave to the 12. And then in chapter 9, it continues. There's the feeding of 5,000. There's the transfiguration, right? Like Jesus and Elijah and Moses, they're all, oh, they're, they're like glowing. And, and James and John, you know, the sons of thunder, they're just like, what? Um, so that, that, that's all happening. Um, and then Jesus turns toward Jerusalem. Right? He's in Galilee, which is way up in the north. And to get from the north of Galilee down to Jerusalem, in the middle, there's a place called Samaria. And they're the people that the Jews didn't like. And they didn't like the Jews. And they didn't treat each other very nicely. So most people would go around, cross the Jordan River, go around Samaria, cross the Jordan River, and come back into Judea, and then go to Jerusalem. But Jesus is like, you know what? I'm going straight through Samaria, baby. So he does. Right? Um, and as we, what we learn at the end of chapter 9, we learn that this whole thing about him sending out two by two, he's, he's doing it a whole bunch of times, right? A whole bunch of times. This is like his, his habit that he's picked up in his final days. It's like he spent like two and a half years, you know, drilling in the disciples. This is what the kingdom is. This is what the kingdom is. This is what the kingdom isn't. And then this last, I don't know how many months, as he makes his way to Jerusalem, weeks or whatever it is, um, I think now he's teaching his disciples, I've taught you these things, and I'm going to tell you how to teach it to other people, right? I'm going to teach you how to be fishers of men, how to, how, how, exactly how to do this. Um, so I'm going to turn back one chapter to chapter 9. I'm going to start at verse 51. This is where we get this idea of this two by two, right? So again, at the beginning of chapter 9, he's already sent out the 12, but then listen to this. This is the end of chapter 9, verse 51. 52. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Right? He's going to travel from Galilee, Jerusalem, but he's going to go straight through Samaria and he's not going to go around. And he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. Now, as we're going to see, Jesus is literally the itinerant evangelist right now. He's sending out advanced teams so that when he finally arrives in the town, Everything will be ready, and there will be a rally. The crowd will gather on a hillside, or maybe they'll, they'll gather at somebody's house, and, and the gospel will be presented, and they, they will meet the man, right? They'll meet Jesus, the Son of God, the Son of David. And so everybody's excited. And so he would send out these advanced teams. The passage continues in verse 53. It says, but the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. Right? Most Jews, again, traveling, they, they would go around Samaria. Jesus chose to go right through it. Um, the Samaritans were waiting for the Messiah, too. Right? They, they, both the Jews and the Samaritans, they, fully, they both felt like they had the correct interpretation of the Bible. They were both waiting for the anointed one, the holy Messiah, and all, all that. Now, but Jesus, if he were their Messiah, the Samaritans' Messiah, he would have been going to their holy mountain at Jerusalem to worship. But since he was going to Jerusalem to worship, he must be a false prophet, 
right? He must, he, he must not be the one we're waiting for. So they're like, don't stop in our town, false prophet guy, right? So, so and then I love it. Then this happens. Luke 54 says, when the disciples, James and John, right, the sons of thunder, they saw this. They said, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? I love it. Sons of thunder, they want to rain down pain on the village for not properly respecting their master, right? You got to understand James and John, like they just saw their master. I mean, he was really, really good and he was doing all these amazing stuff. But then they saw him with Moses and Elijah, the greatest prophets that the, the, they, that, that culture had ever known. And so like Jesus' stock in the eyes of James and John just went through the roof. Like, like, Jesus, we will be your punishers, right? If anybody even looks at you wrong, we will crush them, right? Can you imagine, in my mind's eye, I saw, I saw uh, Mike Hackworth and Chris Hackworth coming down, the sons of thunder, or like maybe John Hedrick and Lonnie Ashley. Like, if you saw those two guys coming down, you're like, oh. Anyway, anyway. <laughs> um, so after seeing Elijah and Moses, Jesus is just like super high in their, their view. And, but Jesus isn't happy with their attitude at all, right? He's not buying into his amazingness. But Jesus turned and he rebuked them. Now catch this. Then he and his disciples went to another village. So we get this idea that he's literally village hopping, like island hopping in World War II, village hopping on his way to Jerusalem. He's hitting every village he can. Time is short. The Son of God realizes, man, I, I got to double my efforts. Not only do I got to be doing this, I got to be training my people to be doing this too. So, set off to another village. This is a habit. Now, remember, this is all occurring, whether disciples realize it or not, as Jesus is teaching them to be good evangelists, right? And being intolerant of skeptics wasn't the way to go, or naysayers. That, that wasn't the, the route that Jesus wanted his disciples to take. And, and a lot of times we do that. We, we want to share Jesus, and, and people kind of make fun of us, and we're like, and then we, like they become our enemy, like almost. Um, Jesus, he's like, no, 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 no. Being intolerant is not the way to go about this thing. In fact, just before this passage, he makes a remarkable statement. As we think about sharing our faith, right, with people unwilling to give us a hearing, Listen to how Jesus responded to that exact situation. This is the exchange in verses 49 and 50. This is right before Jesus rebuked them, and they're going backwards. Master, said John, we saw someone driving out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he's not one of us, so can we go down and rain pain on him, right? And then the brilliant statement by Jesus, he says this, don't stop him, for whoever is not against you is for you. And that's an amazing statement. He realizes, Jesus realizes, and we all realize this, when you're talking about politics and religion, it is so easy to make enemies, right? And so difficult to make friends. I mean, this religion and politics is like, don't, don't mention that at my party, right? I don't want anybody disagreeing and arguing because always politics and religion, oh, everybody gets so bent out of shape. So tolerance is the key. But, but this is incredibly important for Jesus. It, our tolerance can't be built on indifference like, oh, well, <laughs> enjoy hell. <laughs> but it's got to be built on love, right? It, it, we, we've got to see their rejection through the eyes of love. Um, they're not an enemy, right? They're, they're a friend waiting to be discovered, I guess. But Abraham Lincoln was criticized for being too courteous to his enemies. And he was reminded that it was his duty to destroy his enemies. He responded with this, in, this incredible phrase. I think this just matches what Jesus said. Do I not destroy my enemies when I make them my friends? I, I think that was Jesus' strategy. And he was trying to tell the disciples, just because somebody says, no, they're not your enemy. They don't hate you. They're just temporarily rejecting me. Or maybe they don't understand you or me, but they're not your enemy. No quicker way to eliminate an enemy than to make them your friend. Even if people laugh at us and throw rotten fruit at us, right? We've got to never regard them as an enemy to be destroyed, but as a strayed friend to be recovered by love. And I get the distinct impression that that was the way God treated me, and I have a feeling that that's the way he treated you. You were throwing rotten fruit at him, but he said, this isn't an enemy. I need to love this person back. So back to chapter 10, the sending of the 70 or the 72, whichever one you want to go with. Verse 2, it says, he told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his 
harvest field. A couple things very important here. There is a harvest to be had. But there doesn't seem to be much interest in harvesting, right? All the harvesters have found other things to do. But God has been preparing these people, right? So there's a harvest. And it's his field. It's not ours. We haven't been laboring since planting season. We truly haven't invested anything yet. Other people have invested. God has invested. Now, a couple chapters back, Luke tells a similar metaphor. It's about Jesus telling a story about a harvest, this, we had this read earlier, Leanne Jackson read it, chapter 8, verses 4 through 8, parable of the sower. In verse 11, he explains what all that meant. Let's check this out. Verse 11, chapter 8. The seed of the word is God. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones that hear, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and not be saved. Those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in a time of testing, they fall away. The seed that fell among the thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go about their way, they're choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. They never become holy. They never become whole, complete. But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart. In Matthew's retelling of the parable, he calls them the persons who, who hear and understands, right? Who hears and responds well. Noble and good heart, who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. And again, in, in the telling of the story in verse 8, there was a crop of 100 times what was sown. And when Matthew retells the story, it's 30, 60, even 100 times what was sown. So we get this, this picture of the different, both gospel writers combined, like we got this in crazy, crazy harvest. Not like when I used to go fishing, Right? You, they, caught, they, they caught fish. They, they caught people. They actually caught people. Now, there's lots to pull from this passage, but one thing is very, very clear. The seeds are spread on all sorts of soil, but there's only one type of soil that's ready to receive the seed, and that's the good soil. Think about it like this. There might always be a harvest, um, but there's not a harvest everywhere. Again, there's, I, I believe this. There's always a harvest, but there's not a harvest everywhere. Lots of seed, for whatever reason, was cast on soil, not ready to produce a crop at all. Again, back to chapter 10, that was just a little side lesson on evangelism. The instructions continue in verses 3 and 4. It says, go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves, right? In other words, you are armed only with love, and you're going into an armed camp, and they are armed with a whole lot of stuff other than love, like mean, mean tools of damage, right? And, 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 and Christ is calling us like literally lambs. All we've got is love. We don't got a gun. We don't got a knife. We don't got anything with us but love. And we're going into dark places devoid of love, right? So, I mean, he's, he's just, just warning us. But it's not a warning that will stop you from doing it. He continues. Don't take a purse or a bag or sandals. Don't greet anyone on the road. Again, this isn't, you know, be discourteous, but you've got a task to do. That's all he's saying is you've got a task to do. Don't let the world divide you in your task. Yes, you've got living to do. You've got a family. You've got all these other kind of things. But there's an overriding reality that most of this world doesn't see that will trump this world. And if they don't figure it out, they lose. So Jesus is just saying, look, there's a lot hanging in the balance. Don't be foolish with your time. Don't be frivolous. That's all he's saying here. And at the end of chapter 9, he addresses the exact same mentality, right, that spiritual things can wait. Three different people, and this is your homework. I'm not going to go into this. Three different people come up and say, hey, I would love to go with you. I would love to follow you, but hey, I got this. And three different times, Jesus basically says, this is only going to come around once or twice. It might not come around again. Don't blow this opportunity. There's important things hanging in the balance. Consider your priorities. Again, that's your home, part of your homework. Starting with verse 5, the instructions get very, very specific and detailed. Check this out, verse 5 and 6. When you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. And if someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. And if not, it will return to you. What Jesus is doing is he's telling them to look for a specific kind of person, right? In other translation, Luke calls him the man of peace or the son of peace. 
Matthew calls this person the worthy person. Paul refers to them as people prepared in advance. And as we're going to see, these people of these, these people of peace are folks who are, are open to you and they're open to your mission, right? They want to serve you and your mission, right? They want to be, they, they want to open up their home. They want to open up their network of relationships, their family and their friends and their associates to you. These folks are gatekeepers to more good soil. In verse 16, Jesus says this, whoever listens to you listens to me. And whoever rejects you rejects me, but whoever rejects me rejects him who sent me. In other words, the very fact that they're open to you means that they might be open to Jesus. People have a weird way of doing that. They'll accept something if they like the messenger, and if they don't like the messenger, they won't accept the message. We're weird like that. We just are. (sighs) These people, they could be good soul, and they could be gatekeepers to lots more people who our Heavenly Father has prepared in advance to receive his good word and to enter the kingdom. What Jesus has basically done, those of you who are into science, he's given us what's called a litmus test. Now, this is something that I failed all the time because apparently it was a bunch of shades of green. Quite frankly, I don't even know what was on that crazy thing, but I could never tell what was going on, but there's some gradients, and it's an indicator of the acidity or the alkalinity of a substance, right? So it's a tool that tells you the receptivity of a, of a substance to whatever you're, you're going to put into it, a litmus test. So it's basically a simple phrase to throw out there to see if somebody might be open to a spiritual conversation, right? For us in our context, we've kind of got to think about this. What might be the equivalent to peace be with you? Like, we don't use that phrase here. People would probably go and step away from you. Peace be with you. It's just not part of our culture. Um, but, but just in a nutshell, Jesus has taken a very, very common Jewish greeting. He's tweaking it. And then he's infusing it, infusing it with a, a spiritual meaning, a, an overlay, right? For example, in our culture, I mean, this, this is just something that we could do. Folks toss out this one without really expecting any kind of thoughtful or involved answer. Hi, how you doing? We say that all the time. And what's really strange is people say, yeah, yeah, fine. And, and I don't know if you notice this, but sometimes people will stop and actually give you an answer, and it's a little disconcerting. It's like, I didn't expect you to give me an answer. So it's an odd, it's immediately an odd relational moment. It's not an eye-rolling moment, but it's, it's a pregnant moment. That's a weird word. It's a rich, rich moment. Um, so how, how are you doing? And this is the way we, that we could reply, kind of just like what Jesus was doing. Throw out that phrase and see if the cat licks it up. See if it sticks. <laughs> I love those phrases. So how are you doing? You could respond with, hey, great, really curious to see what God is up to today. Right? Or maybe, maybe you could respond, pretty good, I've been praying for something, and I want to see how that plays out today. Or maybe, maybe good, I felt God say something this morning, I was, seemed pretty important, and it was good for me to hear. Right? Like each one of these is like an open invitation to anybody whom God has been preparing in advance. They're going to jump at the opportunity to enter into this conversation. Like, the baited hook is floating around in front of their face and you baited it correctly and they're not running from it. So many people run when they see Christians coming, right? Ah! You got a good baited hook. So what we're doing is we're getting around all the Christianese, right, that offends people. We're just, just throwing out this phrase. Um, and again, there's a hundred phrases that we can use, but each one is an open invitation to discuss things at a deeper level. And the big hint is that they will follow up the question with some more questions and probably a conversation. Step one right there. The instructions continue with verse seven. Stay there, eating and drinking whatever they give you for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. Several things going on here. First of all, just because they enter into a conversation doesn't mean they are a person of peace, good soil. They might just be impolite, right? They don't want to insult you, but they have no intention of really listening to you. So the person that we're looking for will also welcome you and your mission and will want to serve you and your mission. Again, in today's culture, they might not invite you into their home because we're we're kind of a a private culture now, um, but they will invite you into places that feel like home to them. Places where they play, where they work, where they hang out, right? They want to introduce you to these special places and these special people. Not only do they want to welcome you, but they want to serve you and your mission. And Jesus says, let them, right? Stay there. Don't move around. 
See, we, we Christians, we got this need and this assumption to be the superior ones serving inferior people. But Jesus is telling us, the disciples and us, right, when we let people serve us, when we ask them to join our mission, right, we're honoring them and we're valuing them if we let them help us. And Jesus is saying, let them. I don't care what they believe or what they don't believe. Let them help you. They're going to find wholeness by joining you and coming alongside you. Invest in this person as they invest in you and your mission. And then in verse 9, the key to it all. When you enter a town and are welcome, eat what is offered to you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them that the kingdom of God has come near you. Act like the kingdom is in you, right? You ever go to somebody's house? I'm, I'm horrible. I, I have such eating pickiness, right? He's basically saying, don't be a snob. <laughs> don't demand a place at the table, the seat of the honor, the richer foods. You know, just be gracious, right? Pretend like, even if it's not, act like the kingdom is in you, right? So act, show them the kingdom with sacrificial acts of service and kindness, and then tell them about the kingdom, right? It doesn't have to be in this order, but typically when people experience the kingdom, they're far more opening, they're far more open to hearing about the kingdom, right? If they've seen it in action, if they've seen it in you or maybe some other people. Fair for these four simple questions, right? If and when we get to this stage um, that helps us act and show and tell. Four very, very simple questions. Um, how can I pray for you? I know Bob Loon, I, I've seen him do that half a dozen times. I mean, every time I'm with him, We'll be standing in line somewhere, and he'll strike up a conversation. It won't be a Christianese conversation. It'll just be the coolest conversation. And all of a sudden, he'll say, well, what can I pray for you? And will, that, that, the, the counter lady will stop and she'll say, please. It's like, ah, oh, Bob, God, amazing guy. He, he is. So how did this little model play out in Scripture, right? Did Jesus actually do this himself? I'm going to take a look very quickly at chapter 4 of John. The Samaritan woman at the well. Jesus is sitting at the town well. He has a conversation with her, turns her world upside down. And if you read closely, again, you're going to have to go home and read this on your own, but she serves him, right? She's open to a conversation. He tells her about the kingdom by way of a conversation about water. Water, right? He, he just takes a, a casual phrase or a casual situation and he infuses it with spiritual meaning, right? They're getting water at the well. He's doing exactly what he instructed the 12 and the 70 or 72 and all the others to do in every village and town that he went through. We read the, the conclusion, did it work, right? In verses uh, 28 through 30 and 39 through 40, you listen to this, 28, 29. Then leaving her water jar, which tells us like, number one, she's in a rush to tell people about Jesus. And number two, she's coming back, right? She wants this conversation to continue. She wants to continue to welcome and serve Jesus, right? So leaving her water well, the wom leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? Bam, verse 30. They came out of the town, the people, and they made their way toward him. And that phrase right there, making their way toward him, there are a lot of people in our lives currently who aren't saved, but they are, because of your love, because of your sacrificial gifts, because of your generosity, they are making their way toward Jesus. And that's an incredible thing. I, I love that phrase. They're making their way toward Jesus. And then in verses 39 through 42, the story concludes, did it work? Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I'd ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed for two more days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They wanted to invest in Jesus, so Jesus stayed and invested in that village. And there were many, many people who came to Christ in that village. You see, he's working the pattern, the formula, the system. I don't know what kind of word you want to use, but he's kind of doing the same thing. Now, this is amazing. Um, Verse 42, it says this, they said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard it for ourselves and we know that this man really is the savior of the world, right? This woman had been prepared in advance. She was good soil, but she was also a gatekeeper to lots more good soil. Now, push this thing a little bit further. Same pattern, same exact pattern. This time with the bumbling disciples, right? So if it works for them, it will work for you because 
they're just a mess. They're, they're a mess all over the place. Um, Acts chapter 10, Peter and a Roman centurion named Cornelius, they have similar dreams, right? Peter visits. Cornelius is open to a conversation. He's invited his whole family. He's invited all his friends. There might very well be a harvest here. Watch this, verses 44 through 48. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all those who heard the message. The circumcised believers, the Jewish believers that were with Paul, were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have, so he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And here's the kicker. Then they asked Peter to stay with them a few more days, and he does. And you see the pattern repeating itself. He, they want to invest in him. He stays and invests in them and lots more. One last one, the city of Philippi. Read this, starting in verse 13. On the Sabbath, they went outside the city gate to the river where we were expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and we began to speak to the women who had gathered there. So we have a welcome and we have a conversation that has been found, right? Verse 14, one of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyteria named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. And the Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. This is a woman who has been prepared in advance. And Paul just goes down to the riverside and he strikes up a conversation with a bunch of women doing laundry. And Lydia responds, when she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home, right? They want to invest in him and Peter. And if you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. So apparently they stayed at her place. A welcome to a network that led to a friendship within that network. An offer to serve, Paul's persuaded. So he sticks around and he invests in Lydia. One last example, Paul and Silas are in prison. They're singing and they're praying, right? A litmus test. Maybe someone will join us in our singing, right? So they're singing, everything's wonderful, and then an earthquake loosens their chains and it opens the cell doors. The jailer freaks out because if they escape, like, he's going to be put to death, right? That's just the rule. But Paul shouts out, right? Hey, 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 we're here. Nobody's, nobody's escaped. So we have a demonstration of the kingdom. We have an act. We have a show and we have a tell. And the jailer responds, the jailer called for the lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. You and your household. Then they spoke to the word of the Lord to him and all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them. He washed their wounds, and immediately he and all his household were baptized. And in verse 34, the jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. Again, as some of you might realize this, right? This is the fundamental strategy of missionaries around the world. I've talked to my sister. She was in Madagascar, and now she's in Mozambique. This is what they do, talking with the Lobers. This is, this is what their daughter was doing in Portugal and in Germany, just striking up conversations with people and seeing where God has already been working. It is really that simple, my friends. Evangelism, Jesus style, with the Holy Spirit's guidance, and with Jesus' instructions on finding a person of peace, look for people that God has already prepared because there is always a harvest. Again, on that last slide, I would continue, I would ask you to continue the conversation. What did you think? Maybe around your family, with friends, email some folks. A few bow, with a, bow your heads. Father, thank you for this message. Thank you for Luke's chapter 8, 9, and 10. And you, you showed us. And then throughout the book of Acts, you showed us time and time again of, of just this, this, this way of sharing you, like you told us how to share you. Father, give us courage. Make us acutely aware that lives are in the balance. Lord, don't let us ignore the rest of our relationship, but Father, help us understand that people deserve to be in your presence. They deserve to know you. But we, we have to tell them. So, Father, this morning, this afternoon, this evening, however way you're receiving this, who are the persons of peace in my life? Father, guide them to these people as they pray for it. Thank you, Father. In your son's name I pray.
we want to give you a moment um, today, this morning. We want to say thank you to those who have been faithfully giving to the church financially. And uh, we want to give you a moment to continue to do that. You can find a place to do online giving um, at www.richlandnaz.org. You can also use your church center app if you have that, Richland Church of the Nazarene, and you will find us on there as well. Would you pray with me? Let's pray over this morning's tithes and offerings. Heavenly Father God, we thank you and we praise you. And Lord God, you have uh, given us resources to be stewards, good stewards. And Lord God, your word tells us to bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that your work would be done. Father God, that's what we want to give to you today out of an act of worship, out of a heart of worship. We want to bring to you your tithes and our offerings. So Father God, we ask that you would receive them at this moment in time. Lord God, that you would put them to use in your kingdom as you see fit, that you would multiply them to do the work that you need to have done here in the Tri-Cities and across the world as part of the Church of the Nazarene, Lord God, as we, we give to you today. We thank you and praise you for what you've done and for all that you're going to do. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope like wild. Jane! 
Let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand. Heal our streets and land. Set your church on fire. Win this nation back. Change the atmosphere. Build your kingdom here. We pray. Would you extend your hands out this morning and receive the blessing from Ephesians chapter 3? I pray that out of God's glorious riches, that he would strengthen you with the power through his Holy Spirit in your innermost being, so that Christ would dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all of the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and how long and high and deep is the love of Christ, Amen. and to know that this love surpasses all knowledge and that you would be filled to the complete fullness of God. Go in his grace and peace today. Amen.